It is six o'clock and welcome to our next session of Parent Academy. We're so excited that everyone is here. So sit down, relax. We have an awesome presentation for you tonight. My name is Dr. Nancy Turner, and I am your Director of Behavioral and Mental Health Services for our Rock Hill Schools. We have our co-host with us tonight. Hi, Cindy. How are you? Good, Dr. Turner. How are you? <laughs> Good, Good evening, you. Rock Hill. As Dr. <laughs> Turner said, my name is Cindy Talvin Kimmel, and I'm the Director of Parent Smart, Rock Hill Schools Parent Education Partnership, where parents are at the heart of education. And that is just so true. Tonight, our presentation is on an activity that we all do or try to do that affects us every day. Sleep! We have three of our stellar Rock Hill Schools mental health therapists, Ms. Rachel Norris, Ms. Rachel Borwick, and Ms. Krista Switzer. They will present important information about sleep, but first, let me tell you a little bit about our presenters. Ms. Rachel Borwick, Raise your hand. Hello. Hi, Rachel. Rachel is a mental health therapist for Rock Hill Schools and provides therapy services for students and their families at Oakdale Elementary and Saluda Trail Middle School. Rachel earned a Master of, of Social Work degree from Missouri State University. She is a licensed clinical social worker in both North and South Carolina. Rachel has over 10 years of social work and clinical experiences primarily working in the foster care and school setting. Rachel's trained in brain spotting and has utilized the technique to help children resolve their trauma and emotional distress. Her professional interests focus on various mental health challenges that our children face, including attachment issues, trauma, anxiety, anger, and depression. In her free time, she enjoys reading, being active, and spending time with her family. Next is Rachel Norris. Hey, Rachel. Rachel Norris serves Dutchman Creek Middle and Mount Gallon Elementary. She is excited to be part of the Rock Hill School District mental health team this year. She was born and raised in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and received her undergrad degree from Winthrop University, attending the University of Louisville soon after, where she received a Master of Science in Social Work, Marriage and Family Therapy. Rachel is currently a licensed clinical social worker for the state of South Carolina with over 12 years of clinical experience. Rachel utilizes an, inter, an integ, integrative, I want to make sure I said that, approach to therapy, incorporating a system's perspective to encourage and assist students and families as they all work towards a brighter future. Rachel's certification and training include, I'm going to say a lot of letters, T, F, C, B, T, and that's through our MUSC project, A, F, B, T training, suicide bereavement, and grief counseling. When Rachel is not at work, she can be found spending time with her family, cheering on their favorite college teams, attending her daughter's dance performances, or enjoying time in her community. And our third presenter, Ms. Krista Switzer. Hey, Krista. Krista serves Castle Heights and Old Point Elementary. She joined the Rock Hill School District as a mental health counselor in April 2022. Before joining the Rock Hill School District, she served as a student assistant clinical counselor with Keystone Substance Abuse Center. At Keystone, she counseled adolescents and taught drug awareness in the Clover School District. Ms. Switzer also spent a year as a social services assistant at Westminster Health and Rehab Center, where she assisted nursing home residents and their family members with care and support resources. Ms. Switzer received her Master of Social Work degree from Winthrop in 2021. Please welcome all of our presenters. Good evening, everyone. So tonight we are going to be presenting on sleep. We're gonna be talking about the connection between sleep and mental health and the impact it has on both. 
So the title of our presentation tonight is Sleep Bright and Be Bright. My name is Krista Switzer. I'll be starting off the presentation tonight. So before we dive in, just want you all to kind of take a second and think for a minute. How much sleep do you think you get each night? I know for me personally, I feel like I probably don't get enough, maybe about five or six hours of sleep a night. Um, another question I want you all to think about is, do you feel rested in the morning? How do you feel when you wake up? Again, for me personally, I'm pretty tired when I wake up, at least until I get coffee. And the last question I want you all to think about is, how many times a night are you using an electronic device before bed? So these are all some questions to just kind of think about how they relate to you. And then as we kind of dive more into the presentation and give some information, I want you all to kind of reflect back on how you answered these questions and to kind of see how it relates to the things we've talked about tonight. So before we get into the mental health part of sleep and how they connect, I wanna just kind of give some brief statistics on sleeping, just so you can kind of see a little bit more about why sleep is important, how much hours of sleep we're supposed to be getting a night and how it's impacting not only adults, but the, our adolescents too as well in schools. So for adults, they need at least seven hours of sleep a night and more than one third of adults sleep less than seven hours of sleep a night on average. And I definitely fall into that category of one of the adults that are not getting enough sleep a night. Children aged three to five need about 10 to 13 hours of sleep each night. If children are aged around six to 12, they need nine to 12 hours of sleep. And 13 to 19, so our teenagers, need about eight to 10 hours of sleep each night. Now, I don't personally have children of my own, but from working in the schools and talking to the students there, I can see that a vast majority of the students are not getting that much sleep each night. Um, I had a few students just this week alone who told me that they stayed up all night on their phones, talking to friends, or only getting about four to five hours of sleep from playing video games and different things like that. We'll kind of go into more in later in the presentation. So a few more statistics. So adolescents are getting on average five to six hours of sleep per night. Uh, like I said, that's a common theme that I've been hearing too from students that I'm seeing in schools. Children who lose at least 39 minutes of sleep each night have a harder time coping at school. So that means something as little as a little over half an hour of sleep is going to have an impact on them. So if an adolescent is supposed to get eight to 10 hours of sleep and they're only getting, you know, seven, little under that, it's going to have that impact. So people may think that, you know, hey, I at least got seven hours of sleep, even though I was supposed to get eight. So that's still pretty good. But research has shown that even that small amount is still going to have a big impact later on. 58% of middle school students and 72% 72, 72 of high school students are getting less than the recommended amount of sleep each night. So that is more than half of our adolescents and teenagers that are not getting the amount of sleep that they need. And we're going to see how this plays into effect into their mental health and academic performances too as well. 60% of adolescents say playing video games is more important to them than getting sleep. And that's something that I can say I hear a lot. <laughs> a lot of students are staying up late playing video games. They don't want to stop. They love their video games so much. And they think they prioritize that over sleep. So to them, that's more important to them. That's having more fun than making sure that they get the correct amount of sleep each night. 50% of people who watch TV at night before going to bed get less than seven hours of sleep per night. So again, that stimulation of using a, an electronic device is having an impact on how much sleep you're getting. Even though I've heard from a lot of people that using an electronic device helps them relax before going to bed at night, research has been showing that even though you may think it's helping you relax, it's actually having that hurtful effect on falling asleep. It's going to stimulate me, stimulate you. It's going to help keep you up and it's going to make you make it harder for you to fall asleep as easily and as long. So a few more statistics here. 
Chronic sleep deprivation can have a dramatic effect on a teenager's life, including affecting their mental well-being and reducing their academic performance at school. And I'm going to go a little bit more into depth on what exactly sleep deprivation is and how many of these teenagers are falling into that category of being sleep deprived. And smartphones and any other type of electronic device reduce sleep time if used before bed. So just kind of like what I said before, using these electronic devices, even though we think that they're helping us relax or they're helping us fall asleep, um, is actually having the opposite effect. <clears throat> and I know I'm definitely guilty of that myself. Uh, sometimes it's so easy when you're laying in bed, pick up your phone, start scrolling on social media or watching some of those videos. I do that myself. <laughs> and we're not realizing the effect that it's having. It's going to hurt us from falling asleep and getting as much sleep as we need. So sleep deprivation is defined as when an individual fails to get the amount of sleep that they need per night. So for example, us adults need at least seven hours of sleep. So if we're getting even six or six and a half hours of sleep, that would fall under that sleep deprivation category because it's falling under the amount of sleep that we're supposed to get per night. So if you're under that limit of what you're supposed to get for your age group, then that means you're sleep deprived. And based off of that definition, that means about 70% of adolescents suffer from sleep deprivation and they're not getting amount, the amount of sleep that they need per night. Stanford University in a study on sleep with adolescents, they called the sleep deprivation sleep deprivation, it's hard to say, among adolescents an epidemic because they said that it's such a vast majority of adolescents that are sleep deprived, well over half at that 70%. So they described it as an epidemic and something that's greatly impacting children and something that's getting very much overlooked. The main causes of sleep deprivation are biology, screen time, and busy schedules. So biology, obviously hormones, adolescents, teenagers, there's a lot going on. Some of that can help keep them up at night. Um, screen time, so many teenagers, adolescents, and adults included, um, just spend that time before bed watching TV, playing video games, scrolling on your phone, talking on the phone to friends, and all of that is very stimulating again and has the opposite effect. And that blue light from screens too as well can hurt your ability to fall asleep by tricking your brain into thinking that it's daylight. And then also busy schedules. So adolescents have very busy schedules between school. A lot of them have after school activities, sports, extracurriculars. And by the time they get home, a lot of times they're very stimulated or they're trying to cram in a little bit of free time. Okay, I have... It's nine o'clock, I have you know a few hours here to talk to my friends or play these video games. And so they're trying to cram all of that into their busy schedules, which then they're sacrificing sleep to make sure they're getting all that extra free time in. Many mental health disorders manifest in the adolescent years and teenage years. So research has shown that sleep deprivation could either bring about these disorders or exacerbate them. So since most mental health disorders are getting diagnosed in these adolescent and teenage years, they're thinking that sleep could either be the main cause of some of these diagnoses or it's making them worse. So if these adolescents and teenagers are getting the amount of sleep that they need, you'd see a drastic improvement in their mental health. Either for some of them, it may completely go away or for some of them, it will at least get very much better. Sleep deprivation causes depression, anxiety, and stress as one of the main causes that it's impacting mental health. And again, as we're going deeper into the presentation, we'll go more into depth on all of that as well. So some effects of sleep deprivation, we just talked about some of that depression and anxiety and stress. Here's a little bit more in depth. So concentration difficulties, if you're not getting enough sleep, it's going to be a lot harder to pay attention. I know sometimes I feel that if I'm very tired and I go to work, sometimes it's hard to sit there and say, okay, I've got to focus, I've got to get this done because you're so, you're paying so much attention to feeling tired and feeling run down. Mentally drifting off in class. 
I know I see a lot of our adolescents are falling asleep in their morning classes. And a lot of that's because they're just so tired. They're not getting enough sleep at night. So they come to school exhausted and they end up falling asleep in class. Shortened attention span. Again, it's harder to pay attention when you're really tired and worn out all the time. Memory impairment. So it's going to be harder for your brain to store those memories when it's tired and run down. I've been describing sleep to some of the teenagers and adolescents I see as think of sleep like charging your phone. Your phone battery is running low. You've got to plug it in and you've got to charge it. Once it gets fully charged, you get a lot of use out of your phone. If you only charge it for a little bit because you're short on time and then you unplug it, then your phone battery is going to die pretty soon. So I tell them, I said, think of sleep like charging your brain. Just like with your phone battery, you need that correct amount of sleep to get that brain fully charged. If not, it's not going to work the way it should. And then poor decision making. So all of this not only is it impacting mental health from lack of sleep, but then you can see how it's impacting academic performances too as well. Because it's a lot harder to do well in school when you're tired and you're not going to be able to remember what you're learning as well. You're not going to be able to pay attention. You may fall asleep in class and then you're not going to be making the best decisions as well. And I like this little picture that I have here on the side that's talking about the effects of sleep. So when you have lack of sleep, that means you get tired. If you get tired, then you're going to have difficulty coping with daily life. So things that you normally would be able to process and deal with well are going to be a lot harder. Your brain's not going to be able to process it as well. When you're having difficulty coping with these normal life stressors, then that can make some low self-esteem. Then that low self-esteem causes some of that anxiety, that worry and stress, which then that anxiety can make it harder for you to sleep. And then it becomes an endless cycle. So I thought that chart was a good representation a little bit of what lack of sleep can do, and it causes a big ripple effect. A few more effects of sleep deprivation. So lack of enthusiasm, kind of that loss of motivation when you're tired, you don't care as much because you just want to go home and sleep. And I hear that a lot from the students that I see, you know, like, I just want to go home and take a nap. Or, you know, what I want to do today is just get some sleep. Because they're feeling so tired, that's all they care about. I just want to get rest. So they kind of lose some of that interest in doing other things that may normally have interested them. Moodiness and aggression, just like you get hangry when you're hungry, you can get a little bit irritable when you're tired too as well. And a lot of that can fall into, again, that low self-esteem, that depression, that anxiety you're feeling when you're tired. All of that can cause irritability too as well. So again, it's all kind of that big ripple effect. They're all tied together. Again, depression and anxiety, risk-taking behavior. Again, that falls into kind of the poor decision-making that comes about from lack of sleep too as well. You're not going to be able to think as clearly when you're tired. So you're not going to be able to make the best decisions. So maybe you're going to engage in more risky behavior because your brain isn't able to really stop and think about all the effects of the decision you're about to make. Again, that reduced academic performance, which ties into that lack, the memory impairment, lack of concentration, sleeping in class, all of that's going to end up hurting your grades over time. And also slower reflexes. When you're tired, you can't react as well. I know when I'm tired and I'm stumbling to bed, a lot of times I end up tripping into things in my room because you're tired. Again, you're not paying attention as well. You can't react as well. And so if you have some teenagers that are maybe driving a car or playing sports, some of that can be impacted too with that sleep deprivation. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much Krista. Krista. And, and that leads right, right into our next, next part of the presentation, presentation sleep, sleep and mental, mental health and how are they related? related. So, so sleep quality is a measure referring to how well you're rested. And so poor sleep quality, of course, is detrimental on your mental health. So over the next few slides, I want you to keep this thought in the back of your mind. Is sleep a symptom of mental health or does sleep or the lack thereof trigger one's mental health symptoms? So before we get into the bulk of the mental health, I wanted to do a little psych 101. Um, if you ever took a psychology class, you remember Maslow, and this is this hierarchy of needs. 
And, and so, so pretty, pretty much um, um, the theory states, states that our basic needs must be met before an individual can achieve their potential. And, and it comprises of five tiers, as you can see in this picture. Um, and those tiers include safety, esteem, and self-actualization. But, but if you see on the bottom, um, basic needs, he states food, warmth, water, and rest. And, and so, so pretty, pretty much what Maslow is stating is that before you can make that top tier um, creative, activities, um, friendships, peers, things like that. You must meet these basic needs, and that also includes sleep. So I'm not going to go into this whole quote, but I loved it because this is the argument that we're having today. Traditional views suggested that struggles with sleep was because of a mental health disorder or diagnosis, um, but more recent discussions have brought up is sleep and the disturbance of sleep, the, the factor, factor are really causing mental health. So, so let's get into it. it. Um, we, we know, know that sleep helps maintain an emotional, emotional regulation, regulation and, and studies have shown that sleep disturbances are common features, features like Krista said, in most mental health disorders, disorders that we see. Um, um, so I wanted to take a few diagnoses that we see mostly within the school setting. So we're gonna be focusing on ADHD, depression, anxiety, and autism. So I picked this picture because I feel like it truly depicts what some of our students come into our office with. If you can only imagine having all of this in your brain, I mean, stimulation overload is that sugar, fat, salt, please, um, all the feelings, and trying to rest, trying to find peace in the midst of juggling all of these thoughts. Um, these, these are some, some of the issues that our students, students are dealing with when, when we are talking about sleep deprived and trying to find peace at night. So, so what is ADHD? ADHD, um, ADHD is, is a disorder that encompasses symptoms such as inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity. Um, those with those may feel grumpy, irritable, restless. Um, like Krista said, they may have trouble paying attention at school or in their classroom or at work. One, One of the issues I know that we definitely see sometimes in schools is daytime sleepiness, um, which can have a serious effect on school and work. And I have students come in all the time and they're like, they can't shut their minds off at night. And so around 10, 11 o'clock or even 9 o'clock in the morning, they, they are tired and they're restless and they're trying to go to sleep. So that's kind of that daytime sleepiness that they're talking about. Um, and I found a really good quote when we talked about adolescents and the struggles with sleep. Um, it stated that, ADHD, ADHD symptoms. ADHD symptoms. <laughs> Real side. Um, and it says that ADHD, ADHD symptoms, symptoms um, for students 12 and above can see a worsening of sleep um, symptoms. And that can include things like um, heightened symptoms of aggression, um, irritability, and that also can happen because of sleep disorders and concerns. Um, I, I, I love, love a good picture. picture. And, and so, so I, I think, think this loop right here really sums up kind of um, the struggles in sleep and depression. And as you can see this loop, it says disturbed sleep patterns can go to increased lethargy, which can do resistance to depression. And so that cycle just keeps going and going. So what is depression? Depression is described as a persistent bout of sadness, disappointment, hopelessness, as, as well as other mental, physical, and emotional changes that, that can lead to difficulties with daily activities. Sleep problems can increase depression and lead to that negative cycle that you saw in that picture. A study was done recently at the University of Michigan that stated that around 900 young adults found that insomnia was associated with the risk of depression three years later. Um, and for me, I know personally, I don't always take sleep so um carefully or do it as much as I could. And to see that three years later, they saw such an effect of insomnia in terms of depression. Some of the most common sleep concerns connected to depression can include insomnia, hypersomnia, and sleep apnea. Anxiety. Um, anxiety, we all know this one. It is the most common mental health disorder currently in the United States and one that we often see within our school systems. And research shows that most people with anxiety have some sort of sleep disturbance. 
um, whether it's from erasing thoughts or just the exhaustion from not being able to rest. Anxiety can disturb one's sleep, creating a cycle that worsens over time. As you can see in this picture right here, I think it does a really good job of pointing out some of the difficulties with the stress and worry, the difficulty focusing, and just that feeling of fatigue. Um, the different types of anxiety disorders impact people in their sleep differently, um, but a lot of the research has shown a lot of concerns at night, keeping um, this loop of their thoughts, as you're seeing in this picture, this picture, and not learning how to stop the loop. And so again, um, more or lack of sleep can cause us more anxious anxiety, the worries, and then the loop continues. Autism um, is one that we have definitely seen an increase in over the years, and this is the developmental and neurological disorder that affects about 2% of people in the United States. And go ahead. <laughs> And, and what was very interesting in this, and in that in a lot of the data I saw, they pointed out how sleep problems is one of the most urgent concerns for our families with students diagnosed with autism, but it is the least studied aspect of autism at this moment. Um, and so that just blew my mind that we are acknowledging that it is such a huge component of our students and just people in general who struggle with autism, but there's not a lot of research on that topic right now. Um, many report difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, and restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome also came up a lot with ADHD, and that is where you kind of have the uncomfortable sensation in your legs, um, which can create an overwhelming, overwhelming urge to move throughout the night. So if you can imagine trying to rest and you have just this uncomfortable, uncontrollable movement on top of constant thoughts, intrusive thoughts, um, waking up at night, not being able to get a true restorative sleep or truly fall into the room sleep. Of course, that would um, challenge how you interact with other people, how you perceive emotions and interactions with others. Part of this data says that 50 to 80 percent of people with autism report sleep problems. Um, and evidence show, as I stated, that that rhythm, that daily rhythm of not going into a truly restorative of REM sleep. On average, it takes about 11 to 21 minutes longer for them to fall asleep, um, and they wake more frequently throughout the night. And these are just some other resources um, that I found that was great. Um, sleep Foundation was a great one, especially um, for a mom of young ones, it talked a lot about not only the difficulties of falling asleep, um, but a lot of them talked about the movement at night, and that's something that I never really thought about, whether your child has a true mental health diagnosis or not, but um, waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to go back to sleep, um, the movement, the back and forth to the restroom, any of those changes can disrupt their sleep pattern, and then you see it in the morning when they're a little more restless, a little more frustrated, or not willing to participate as much. So a quick recap. So what does this mean? What happens when you don't get sleep? Well, your judgment and concentration are impaired. Emotions are heightened, and your reaction time is slowed. And if you were listening, and I know it caught me off guard, sounds a lot like the mental health diagnosis that we discussed as well. So insufficient sleep can definitely lead to anxiety, depression, defiance, poor attention span, poor motivation, and just being easily frustrated. And that list can go on and on. Um, and if we were to summarize it, is that sleep can be definitely a factor in your mental health. And it can be one of the triggers to strengthen or heighten those symptoms that ones might see. Thanks, Rachel. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Borowick. Um, I've been doing school-based mental health therapy for the past five years, and I've worked at elementary, middle schools, and high schools, and like across the board, every age, I've seen how lack of sleep has been affecting our children. So I'm excited to share with you guys some factors that influence children's ability to sleep, and then tips for you to help, um, or tips for you to help your child. But first, I wanted to briefly talk about how lack of sleep affects our brains. So we know it has a cognitive impact, but why is that? And that's because things happen in our brain while we sleep. So um, you see this 
first picture. So sleep helps restore the brain by flushing out toxins that build up during our waking hours. So in that picture, you see the blue at the top, that's called cerebral spinal fluid, and it flows through our brain and clears out toxins that impact decision-making, problem-solving, memory, and so on um, during our sleep. So if we aren't sleeping, our brains don't have the ability to clear out those toxins. Okay, and this is another cool um, picture. So um, this is a picture of an MRI scan and MRIs can detect blood flow in the brain. So the areas that are working hardest show increased levels of activity, which is the orange areas. Um, so you could see the scan on the left shows um, a brain activity during cognitive tests. And the one on the left is a normal night's sleep and then the one on the right is a sleep deprived brain. So you can see how the one on the left is working a lot harder than the one on the right. Um, so I just thought those were kind of cool to show the impact sleeping has in our brains. Um, and based off both pictures, we can really see how the lack of sleep can change the processes in the brain. Okay, so I wanna to talk to you guys about some factors that influence sleep. And I think one of the big things we're seeing with kids is screens. Um, I think we've all seen the impact screens have had on our children. Um, the average child ages eight to 18 spends seven and a half hours per day looking at screens. And that ends up being like 43% 40 of the waking hours. So they're spending a, a majority of their day on screens. Um, and of those with devices in the rooms, 36% wake in the middle of the night to check them. Um, and then 41% of teens will get seven hours of sleep or less. Uh, so you can really see that link between screens and getting adequate, adequate sleep. Okay, so why does screens affect our sleep? Bright screens stimulate the part of our brain that's designed to keep us awake. So looking at a brightly lit screen prior to sleep can make for a restless night. And that's really because device screens produce blue light, which suppresses production of melatonin. And that makes it difficult for many people to turn off their brains and fall asleep. Uh, blue light can also reduce the amount of time you spend in slow wave and REM sleep. And those are two stages of sleep, of the sleep cycle that are really vital for cognitive functioning. Okay, so using devices with screens before bed can increase the amount of time it takes someone to fall asleep and their quality of sleep. Um, there's been numerous studies that have established a link between using devices with screens before bed and increases in the amount of time it takes someone to fall asleep and their quality of sleep. Okay, so now I want to touch on some tips to help with screen use. Okay, so limiting time for kids is vital for their sleep. The American Academy of Pediatrics used to recommend limiting screen times to two hours per day but they realize it's not really realistic to set a general guideline for all children. So it's important to figure out how much time on screens is best for your child. Um, they recommended focusing on quality of screen time versus quantity. So be aware of how much time your child is spending on screens, but also focus on activities that are educational, active and social over those that are just passive and solitary. Um, there's really, there's evidence that roles focusing on content, co-viewing, communication are associated with better well-being outcomes than roles focused solely on the amount of time kids are on screens. Um, so watching something together or doing activity together um, on technology can really be a way to connect with your child. And then turning off electronics at least one hour before bed. So that's definitely the ideal um, situation, but if that's not practical or realistic for your family, then here's some tips to also like minimize that risk. Um, one of those is keeping electronics out of children's and teenagers' bedrooms to ensure no light game, no late night gaming or texting takes place. Um, like I said earlier, 36% of children with technology in the rooms will wake in the middle of the night and check them. So a way to help remove technology from bedrooms is um, you can set up a charging station outside the room and that will kind of reduce that um, desire for them to, che to check their phones or technology during the middle of the night. 
and then uh, reducing exposure to blue light. Um, that's an important one. You can do that by turning down the brightness or switching your device to nighttime mode um, in the late evening, or even you can utilize blue light blocking glasses. Okay, so another factor in influencing sleep is food. Um, it's really important to recognize the connection between nutrition and sleep. Poor nutrition impacts the quality of our sleep, but also not getting adequate sleep will affect nutrition. Studies have found that people who don't get enough sleep are more likely to increase their food consumption, and they're also more likely to eat high calorie foods. So it's really important to have a balanced diet made up largely of um, a variety of vegetables and fruits because it provides a broad range of vitamins and mineral, minerals that contribute to better sleep. Um, a lack of key nutrients such as calcium, magnesium, and vitamins um, are associated with sleep problems. And uh, then be mindful what time you eat. So consuming a meal less than two hours before sleep can uh, greatly impair your sleep quality. Okay, so these foods are the best for promoting sleep. They contain essential minerals like magnesium, potassium, and calcium, which are known to support sleep. So incorporating, incorporating them in your diet can be helpful. And you can even like Google each one of those fruits and vegetables and see how they directly impact sleep. It's really kind of cool. Okay, sleep hygiene. So um, we know lack of sleep has been affecting our children and us, um, but here are some tips to improve sleep hygiene, in which that basically just means healthy sleeping habits. So something really important to do is setting a schedule um, and make sure your child follows that schedule even on the weekends. I see a lot of students where they stay up really late on the weekend and then Sunday night comes and they can't fall asleep at a decent time. And then it takes them a few days to get back on their normal cycle. And then the weekend comes again and they're staying up late. So it really causes an unhealthy cycle. So being consistent with the schedule, no matter weekends or non-school days. Um, avoiding caffeine later in the day. Um, that's definitely helpful. So being conscious of having coffee, soda, or energy, energy drinks close to bedtime. Um, but also pay attention to any medication your child takes before bed because there's a lot of medic medications that have caffeine in it. Um, I learned that the hard way one night, I took Excedrin before bed and I was up for hours. I'm like, why can't I fall asleep? And then it hit me, I'm like, oh, Excedrin has caffeine in it. <laughs> so definitely be conscious of that too. Um, and then avoid napping. So that's another thing I see a lot with students. Um, they stay up really late and then they're exhausted all day at school. So they come home and they nap for a few hours, but then their bedtime comes, um, and they're not tired because they've just woke up a couple hours ago, a couple hours ago. So, um, they stay up late again and it becomes this really unhealthy cycle. So definitely limit, um, napping. And then using your bed only for sleep. So we really need to train our brains to associate bed with sleeping so it's important to only use your bed for sleeping. So don't use screens in bed, don't talk on the phone or even read. Um, and I know that's a really hard one, but it really can be helpful to associate, for our brains to associate sleeping with our beds. And then making your room comfortable. So make sure it's not too hot, not too cold, make sure it's dark and try to reduce any noises. And then turning off screens. So like I said earlier, try to get off screens at least one hour before bedtime. Uh, and then eating your fruits, fruits and vegetables. Like I said earlier too, they have lots of minerals and nutrients that really can improve your sleep. So I hope those tips help and you're able to figure out what works for your family and what's really realistic for your lifestyle. Um, but now we're gonna go back to Krista. He's gonna share some resources. Thank you, Rachel. So we're going to talk about some different tools that you can use to help you relax and get ready for sleep. So just like Rachel was talking about, that sleep routine is really important. Um, another thing that you can do is trying to do the same thing every night before you go to bed, <clears throat> because then your brain starts to associate 
when that routine starts, okay, now you're going to do X, Y, and Z, and then you're going to go to sleep. So then your body kind of starts preparing for sleep early rather than starting to prepare for sleep right when you crawl into bed. So for example, for me, I will, after dinner, I'll usually drink a cup of tea, then I will go shower, crawl into bed, read for a little bit, and then go to sleep. So my body associates that routine of probably when I start drinking that cup of tea, okay, you're going to go shower, read a book, and then go to sleep. So that melatonin kind of starts kicking in already because your body starts to prepare early for sleep. If you start doing something different every night before you go to bed, then your body doesn't know to start getting ready for sleep until you turned off the light and you're trying to go to sleep. So that can make it harder for you to fall asleep. Some other things you can put into that sleep routine are different relaxation tools. So doing something that just kind of helps you calm down, you know, especially for adolescents and teenagers, school is very stressful. You know, they have a lot on their plates, extracurricular activities. There's a lot of friendship dramas. There's just a lot going on. It could be a tough time to be an adolescent and a teenager. So I know they're under a lot of stress. They have a lot of anxiety. And especially if they have some of these mental health challenges, doing something relaxing can just help get their body ready for sleep and help them unwind from the day. So these are some apps that exist that are really good for relaxation. Um, you're certainly welcome to take a picture of this if you want to use it later. So the first app is Calm. Um, it's a very popular app. Um, I'm sure probably a lot of you have heard of it, but they have a lot of relaxation tools on there. They have guided meditations. They have relaxing sounds, nature sounds. Um, sometimes they'll do like bedtime stories and they'll do just different a lot of different like stories, sounds, sometimes they have music, um, just a lot of different things on there to just relax. Also Headspace uh, is another app that's very similar to Calm. A lot of they have, you know, similar content on there, the guided meditations, stories, guided imagery, uh, relaxing music, different things like that. So the two apps are very similar, but they have a lot of content. They have uh, free things available and also subscriptions too as well. Better Sleep is another app that I came across. It also has your guided um, meditations, relaxing sounds, music that Calm and Headspace has. But another thing that Better Sleep had was you were actually able to keep track of your sleep in the app and it would let you know if you were getting enough sleep or not. So I thought that was really interesting, especially for adolescents or teenagers if they're not sure how much sleep they're supposed to get, um, they can put it in, in the app and it'll let you know. And it will also give them tips on how to get better sleep too, if they're getting under. So I thought that was really interesting. I made that app a little bit different than Calm and Headspace. This last one is called Finch. It's not really a relaxation tool, but more of a mental health app. Um, it focuses a lot on self-care and you make a little animated pet that helps motivate you to practice self-care and form healthy habits. And the pet will like celebrate and be really happy for you when you do things and you kind of check it off. So certainly getting more sleep can definitely be a form of self-care. And if your adolescent or teenager uses that app, they can set sleep as one of those self-care habits that their Finch pet can celebrate. It's a really cute app and it's, it's a pretty fun one to to do. It makes self-care and taking care of your mental health really fun, especially for adolescents and teenagers. There's a lot of relaxation tools on YouTube too as well. So ambiance videos are one. Ambiance videos have a still image typically with either like nature sounds, um, fireplace, rain sounds. A lot of times they can be like seasonal too as well. So you can do winter ones, fall ones, summer, spring, uh, different things like that. So those can be very relaxing to unwind before bed too as well. Another one that YouTube has, they are called ASMR videos. So ASMR stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. Uh, it basically gives your brain, I heard it's described as like a massage, basically. It makes your brain feel like what you're watching is actually happening to you. Um, so it, that can be very relaxing. 
I know some people don't like ASMR videos. Um, they find them a little bit different. So it really just kind of depends on your comfort level, uh, if you find that relaxing or if you find like this isn't for me. Um, but I'm going to show different examples of each later on so you can kind of see what they're like. And the last one, of course, are guided meditations. Those are in those apps that I had showed you in the previous slide, and they're also on YouTube too as well. All right, so I'm gonna show some examples of each of those three, uh, not very long, just little snippets, but just so you can kind of see what those are like. Again, you can find these on YouTube. Now it says I am sharing my sound. So someone give me a thumbs up if you can hear it when I hit play, that'd be awesome. All right, so this first one is an ambiance video that I showed uh, that I explained in the previous slide. So this is a fall one. And again, those ambiance videos are just kind of those still images that just kind of have those relaxing sounds. All right, so that was an ambiance video. Again, it's a still image. It has that fall scene in there and you just have kind of those relaxing sounds. You heard a fireplace, um, you heard some nighttime insects, crickets chirping, things in the background. Uh, if you kept watching the video, it's eight hours worth, so it's very long. <laughs> if you kept watching it occasionally, you would hear some like leaves rustling, footsteps, you know, just kind of those relaxing sounds. There we go. The next one I'm going to show just a little snippet of again. This is an example of an ASMR video, and it's an old-fashioned French lesson. I'm just going to show about a minute of this too as well, just to kind of give you all an idea. So ASMR goes with um, like whisper sounds, touch, um, you know, crinkling, fingers tapping, little things like that that give you that brain massage. So you're going to hear some of that in there. So there we have the numbers from 1 uh, to 20. Fun. Now let's see how we pronounce these. So that was an example of an ASMR video. Again, I didn't show the whole thing. It's about 30 minutes long. But it gives you that brain massage, that relaxation where, you know, she's talking very quietly. She was moving her hands along those counting beads. You hear kind of the sounds and things like that that give your brain that relaxation, that massage. Um, and that can be very soothing and de-stressing. Let me get the slide to turn. There we go. <laughs> this last one, I am going to do the whole video. It's about two minutes long, but it is a guided meditation. So guided meditations will focus on breathing and relaxing the muscles. Sometimes they'll do like a guided imagery. Um, and it's just to kind of help you focus on relaxing your body, focusing on your breathing, relaxing your muscles, and just kind of de-stressing from the day. So we are going to do this guided meditation here. So I encourage you all to relax and get comfortable. Again, it's only about two minutes long, but allow this video to just kind of relax you and help you unwind from the day.
Welcome to today's guided meditation. In honor of National Relaxation Day, we are going to take some time to let go of any stress and worries. Just be present in our bodies and remind ourselves of what is true in this moment. Begin in a comfortable position with eyes closed. Connect with your body, feeling where you are in space. Take a deep breath in and send yourself gratitude for finding the time in your busy day to relax. And deep breath out, letting go of any stress and worries from the day. Allow yourself to sit with any negative feelings you may be moving through right now. Where do you feel them in your body? Breathe into that space deeply. And as you release your breath, let go of your worries. Imagine them floating away, being carried far away by your breath. Let go a little more each time you breathe. Breathing in and out. In and out. Connect again with your breath, feeling the gentle rise and fall of your chest. Breathing in and out. In and out. Come back again to your body, feeling where you are in space. Move about in any way that feels good. And whenever you are ready, slowly open your eyes. All right, so that was a guided meditation. I hope that all helped relax you. I know it helped relax me a lot. <laughs> so guided meditations are really good. They help relax you. They help you focus on breathing, processing emotions. Uh, like that one had you kind of let go of your worries. And especially for adults and adolescents and teenagers too. So doing something like this before bed um, can really just help all of that tension, that stress, that anxiety just kind of melt away, helps them feel a lot more relaxed and just helps get their brain back into that sleep mode. Um, and so having these relaxation exercises as part of your routine before bed can be really beneficial and they don't have to be very long. Like that guided meditation was two to three minutes. Um, so certainly you can find a short one or you can find a longer one too as well um, if you feel like you need it. But on those busy days when you feel like you don't have too much time, finding a two-minute guided meditation or listening to one of those ASMR ambiance videos to just kind of relax or turning on one of those apps, the Calm app, Headspace, different things like that. Um, just making that part of your routine before going to bed is a good way to just get you prepared. 
So as we wrap up this presentation, uh, this last slide, I thought this picture just kind of helps summarize everything that we talked about today. So the importance of sleep, why it's important, how we can sleep better, and what happens if we don't get enough. Um, I'm not going to go through it all because I know we just talked about it all. But again, you're welcome to take a picture of the slide um, as I felt like this just kind of summarized everything we talked about today. Um, I really appreciate you all coming out and listening to our presentation on sleep today. Well, we thank you all for giving such valued information. You know, we we take sleep for granted. And as you all pointed out, it, it's it's the uh, the the point where we live our lives and and if we don't have that sleep as you all talked about so so well, it affects every single thing that we do every single day. I have to tell you, I did not know about the fruits and vegetables. I learned so much. Uh, that I just love <laughs> hearing all these presentations. I, and I, I said, oh, I love mangoes. Maybe that's something when I'm having, you know, trouble sleeping or I'm just like wired from the day. I can sit down, have a little piece of fruit, uh, a cup of uh, decaffeinated tea or or something. And I didn't know about those fruits and veggies. That was great. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, Cindy? We don't have any questions in the chat. Um, I did put the mental health hotline in there, but I one thing I wanted to point out from the perspective of Parent Smart, you know, we work with families with young children, preschool children, and that you said part of the routine is to read a book. And it's, it's so calming, you know, you go through your daily routine of putting the child to, you know, getting ready for bed and, and having a bath and, and getting them tucked in and then just sharing that, that last moment at night to share a nice story and be able to cuddle and let them go off to sleep. So thank you for sharing that. Really, every slide was so important. Yes. One thing that I would like our viewers to take a look at is what is their routine? First, is there a routine? What is that routine? And it's going to look different, as you pointed out, for the little ones. And Cindy, as you said, for our young, our young children, the you know, middle school students will have a different routine, even high school. But there should be a routine. What about the adults? Uh, that's rhetorical. We should have a routine. And whether we're working or grandparents, whatever we are doing during the day, we're busy. We're busy. One thing when I will lay down, I'll start thinking of things that I have to do tomorrow or thinking of things that I don't want to forget. This might sound simple or maybe old fashioned, but I have a little pad of paper and a pen next to my bed. And if I think of something that I don't want to forget, I will write it down. And that way I'm not trying to remember it all night. And that, that, that's helpful for me. Um, so something as simple as that might be helpful for whether you're a, a teenager, young adult, or a parent. Um, let's see, I, I made some notes too. Uh, I love um, the charging station. We have so many families that say, well, I don't want a power struggle at night. You know, I don't, I, I don't want to start with that. You know, we're finally calm in the house. If he or she wants to take her phone, it all has to be charged. And I love that. Have that charging station. Mom and dad, put your phone there. It's time for your phone to be charged. The student, the children, everybody puts their phone at whatever time at the charging station. And then it's out of the bedroom. Um, so I love that idea. All right. Before we close, uh, Rachel Norris, Orwick, Krista, anybody, a few last words. And then, of course, Cindy. Um, one thing I want to add that I forgot to touch on is that always make sure if your child's not sleeping that you let their pediatrician know because it can, they can have a sleeping condition. It could be a medical condition causing the lack of sleep. So make sure you let them know so they can either roll that out or confirm like that is what is going on. So that's really important. Very good advice. 
Rachel Norris, anything? Um, I know for me, I love how you just pointed out, Dr. Turner, the importance of an adult having a routine as well. Um, I know as a mom of two young ones, if I've stayed up all night working and then I snooze my alarm clock three, clock three times in the morning, then that makes me rest. So then I make this. So then I pour that into them as I am rushing them out of the door and I am running for their lunch boxes and we're throwing things together. So as we are winning routines for our children, we have to model that, but that also can help with our own mental health. Um, I'm not as anxious. I'm not as stressed. I'm not as needing that extra cup of coffee in the morning if I've gone to bed as well. So I love that you stress not only sleep and the importance for our students, but sleep importance for us as well. And thank you for reiterating that. Thank you. Krista, anything else? And if you don't, that's fine. I don't John of Spot. Just wanted to say, kind of going off of what Rachel said, you know, it's good for us adults too to have that good sleep routine. And I think if we're showing our adolescents and teenagers we can get enough sleep, then they're going to feel more motivated to get enough sleep too as well. And I know after doing this presentation, I've realized that I definitely need to get more sleep that night. <laughs> I agree. Cindy? Um, one thing, you know, everybody said that the, the adults need to have a routine and whatever, but I think adults, the parents need to know that they are their child's first teacher and that they have to set limits for their children. And there are ways to control their devices to set timers so they can only be on for a limited amount of time. So, you know, if you can't do the charging station or something like that, you could set a limit that the phone, you know, goes down or the iPad goes down after a certain amount of time. My daughters do that with their children with their iPads. Mm -hmm. So those are some things to look at as well. There are controls. Great advice. All right. Well, we could talk about sleep for a very long time because it it affects everybody. But I want to thank you. Thank you, Rachel Norris, Rachel Borowick, Krista Switzer. Thank you so much. Your expertise, your wealth. I love your whole presentation. You are articulate and so well-informed. I hope that this was meaningful for our audience in Rock Hill. Also, as always, Cindy, thank you for joining us. We thank, thank our viewers for taking the time tonight to learn about sleep. I also, as Cindy mentioned, want to remind everyone that the Rock Hill Mental Health Resource Hotline is 803-324-7464. Um, please utilize that. Although we are not staffing it personally, we have great resources that are available. And thank you always, Rock Hill and beyond, for tuning in every Thursday. Remember, all Parent Academy presentations are free and will air live from 6 to 7 on the advertised date. So thank you, team. And thank you, Rock Hill. Take care of yourself. Take care of your loved ones. And we will see you next week. Good night.